Swimoutlet.com delivers the best online shopping experience. With an extensive selection and the lowest prices, you're guaranteed to find the product you need. Here's what you get. Free shipping on all orders over $49. Free one to two day shipping on all orders over $99. All orders placed by 6 p.m. ship out the same day. Shop at SwimOutlet.com, the web's most popular swim shop. This is a special edition of the Morning Swim Show. I'm your host, Tiffany Elias, here at the American Swim Coaches Association, joined by head coach of Osprey Aquatics, Brian Bolster. Thank you, Tiffany. Glad to be here. Glad to catch up with you again. So, not your first Ask a Clinic. How's it going this round in Vegas? Well, uh, I'm enjoying it. I think this is our 12th Ask a Clinic that we've been to and uh, seen a lot of really good speakers. Um, saw Bob Gillett, and he was tremendous. Uh, Eddie Reese, um, Bill Sweetenham, and Dave Saylor were all first rate. Well, speaking of speakers, you were actually put on your own talk, sponsored by Finis this, this round. So what were you here to talk about? I was here to talk about the winning edge in swimming, and uh, that is really speed maintenance, which uh, is something I think a lot of people understand, but we're trying to popularize it more and systematize it so people understand it. So speed maintenance is the ability to maintain target stroke rate and target stroke length under the stress and fatigue of racing conditions. Okay, so how do you do that? That's a great question. So there are three basic uh, components to speed maintenance. Uh, the first is correct stroke mechanics. Um, the second would be uh, highly developed energy systems, aerobic and anaerobic. And then the third would be stroke specific strength. And in some ways that's the key. So is this more drill related stuff in practice that you're doing or types of sets? What are you actually having your swimmers do to keep that speed endurance? It's an excellent question. Um, it's actually all three. So uh, how do you develop that? You, uh, you have to drill it first because you want to establish neural pathways. And neural pathways are established uh, initially you do things slowly, you groove neural pathways, that's called potentiation. It's like learning to play a new instrument and um, that's called explicit training. So first we drill, then we swim relaxed. And when we swim relaxed, we'll do a set like 850s on a minute. Let's say we're going freestyle and it's your best stroke count. Then you take that set and then you'll come back to go 2100s with that stroke count plus one with five seconds rest, we use a tempo trainer, we train aerobic, aerobic capacity, and they have to make sure that their stroke count doesn't go more than one above what they had drilled and what they had swum relaxed. So if you got a, a girl who's 49 and 100 yard free, and she goes, uh, let's say she takes 12 strokes in those 50s, she's gotta be 13 strokes on every one of those hundreds. And when you get tired on the back half of that thing, that's where you start to build some stroke specific strength. And so we go from easy to tired right there. Mm -hmm. So every swimmer should know how many strokes they're taking per lap. Yeah, basically, you know, I, I ran into uh, Bob Bowman right before my talk and uh, we were able to chat briefly and I congratulated him on the phenomenal job that he's done with Michael Phelps and also um, with uh, Alison Schmidt. And we talked about her race in uh, London and how we was able to drop a cycle or she was able to after working with him on her First, second 50 of her 200 free in London versus Olympic trials. She went from 38 to 36 strokes, I believe. And he attributed that to better underwaters, but also just more efficiency. But the long, at the end, what you want to take from that is that he says that when they're training and they're training race pace, and this is do it when you're racing, he says he doesn't even worry about tempo. He just times with his watch and he counts strokes. So I think that's the key. You got to maintain your length when you're tired. That's what's interesting is because when I swam, my coaches really didn't enforce us to count the strokes, and that seems to be a really a big topic of discussion among the elite swimmers. Speaking to someone earlier, and you can elaborate on this because I think you were the one who had shared this with them, was Sun Yang and his mile and how many strokes he took relative to the field. And can you tell us more about that? Yeah, great, uh, great question there. So Sun Young uh, wins the uh, 1500 meter free, and in the first 400, not counting the first 100 because the first 100 you're just getting into it. But if you really want to look at people's stroke counts and they're swimming a, a mile or a, a 400 or something, you're going to start on that third 50. So on that third 50 for the next 400 meters, he's 28 strokes a lap, and then NBC cut away. <laughs> But then when you came back into the last 400, for the first 300 of that, it's 28 strokes. And so he's being incredibly efficient, and he's holding virtually the same time on every 50, and that's why he was so successful. So he's been able to perfect that. He has mastered speed maintenance, and it's interesting you say that because they had a clip of him and Dennis Cottrell, the Australian coach, in practice, and um, they had their voices lay over, and they had some interview stuff. So the one thing that you heard from Dennis Cottrell talking to his athletes while they're in the water was, check your stroke counts. Well, how do you know how many strokes you should be taking? 
That's a good question. So I think you start, uh, you have to come at it from two different ways. Number one, you have to drill, like I said, and then do a set where you do some stroke count relaxed. And then you start to do something where you take the intensity up somewhat incrementally and you add a stroke as you go. So that 2100, you add one stroke. And we might come back the next day and go 20 more 100s with a 1-7 tempo. We'll add two strokes. The other way you do it is on the, on the race end is you note what their stroke count is in the race. So again, let's go back to a 100 freestyler. I have a girl who goes 51 in a 100 free, and for her, we need her to be 17 strokes or less on each 25. And knowing that, watching her in the race, maybe she's 17 strokes on the first two laps, and the last lap she's 19. That tells me, hey, we need to train for 17. So what you'll do is you'll set that stroke count for her, and no matter what you're doing in your race pace training, you'll say, you got to be 17 strokes or less. Okay. Okay, so for the coaches that weren't able to attend your talk, what is the one thing that they should have walked away from, that you hoped they would have walked away from? That they would value length when the swimmers are tired because what happens is you can train race pace, broken fast swims. I mean, you think about it. No one can swim a 200 at goal pace straight when they're not tapered. So by definition, if we're going to train race pace, we've got to break it up. We're going to go 450s, we're going to go 75s, 25s, however we're going to do it. What I've learned is somebody can train race pace with the tempo and have their length fall apart and their stroke count come up, and you think you're okay, and then you get into the meet, and you add those cycles and it costs you. So the key when you're training race pace, as Bob Bowman does, is count the strokes. Mm. Now, what... What you are talking about is something that swimmers need to perfect. Another thing that we can associate Bob Gillett with is the underwater, and he gave a, a talk as well. Can you share what his was about? Yeah, his was an excellent talk, and underwater speed is something that uh, that we work on a lot, and I've had some success with my athletes, but Bob is the master in so many ways, and he talks about fish kicks and the difference between fish kicks and dolphin kicks. A mammal kicks flat, a fish is kicking on its mm -hmm. side. And Bob has done a lot of research with the scientists, uh, fish scientists, as he puts it. And based upon the vortices coming off the kick, and I don't want to have to get too technical right now, but just let's go to the shorthand. You're faster on your side because of the vortices, and you got to get your swimmers to do it. And a lot of swimmers don't understand, but that's something that Bob shared with me about two and a half years ago, and I started doing it the next week, mm -hmm. and we saw great results Huge from difference. it. And what Bob likes to see is if you can be on your side kicking fast, and if you can get your distance per kick, it's the same thing, stroke length or, or kick length, if you can get it up. So two underwater dolphin can equal one surface stroke, and you're training or racing with a tempo of 0.45 on your underwater kicks, now that's a tempo of 0.9. And most world-class female butterflies are swimming with a tempo of 1.1. 1 .1. So you're going to gain two tenths if you're efficient underwater doing it. You're going to win. It's a winning edge. So much math and science behind, behind swimming that I think a lot of people just don't realize. You know, it's an art and a science, and that's what we as coaches have to be good at. You know, it's not enough just to come out there with a bunch of numbers. How do you implement that? How do you incorporate that? And how do you teach your swimmers so they gain the proficiency to execute? And on that note, something that we've talked about in the past, now you've had your bolster paddles. Uh, yeah paddle that you've designed and can now is now is now a finesse product is that correct yes we've licensed it to finesse so why don't we touch on that how it implements into training well it's a really good paddle and uh, it's based upon the principles that i learned from bill boomer the great stroke theoretician and you want uniform application of force in a vertical form when you're swimming. So athletes want to be swimming here with that, what I call the paddle blade, from fingertip up to elbow. And most athletes are going to break their wrist at some point. Now, there may be a point where you specifically want to break your wrist. That's different. This paddle won't hurt you in that regard. You can still break the wrist at the end of the stroke if you want, um, and you practice that. But what this paddle does really well, and I think better than anything else out on the market, is it creates that uniform application of force, and it's anatomically specific. So it's curved under here. So you get from here to here with the paddle, you're able to get your elbow up. You can't break your wrist. If you do break your wrist, then, well, you can't. And most people, what they tend to do is, the only time they break their wrist is when they drop their elbow to hold water. So now you keep your elbow up, you don't break your wrist, you're holding more water, you got a longer stroke, you have less cycles, you're faster. In just a short period of time, you've shared so much knowledge, which is why this ASCA clinic and other clinics around the country are so important, but ASCA in particular, because you run into everybody's here. You have a lot of the head, co the, a lot of the top coaches, some athletes show up, coaches from all over. You ran into Bob Bowman not too long ago and were able to, to talk with him too, correct? Yeah, and then as I said before, what Bob uh, really does so well, and I think 
better than almost anyone, is he's focusing on the deck on their times and their stroke count. That's mm -hmm. it. He's not even worried about tempo. You know, when you've been coaching long enough, Tiffany, I can look at someone and I can tell what their tempo is, you know, and I'm going to be pretty close on that, and I can see when I'm going to get that effort. And if you think about Michael Phelps' 200 fly in Beijing, remember, his goggles filled up with water. So the only way he knew where he was is, and he said, I was hoping and praying and thinking, I was counting my strokes and my kicks, just like I'd done in exactly. practice. So, you know, you are what you repeatedly do. You are a product of your training. The way you train is the way you race. If you can train with length, and if you can train at race pace speed, you're gonna be successful, and there's no better example than Michael Phelps. Brian, thank you for sharing all of your knowledge. Thank it's you, Tiffany. been great having you on the show. Appreciate it, anytime. Thanks, Brian.